here, but uh, yeah, he ensures that he practices and all that business. And then I'm I'm more on the sports side of things. <laughs> nice. So tell me, where'd you get the T-shirt from? Oh, um, do you know that store, Fifty Four East? It used to be at uh, Birch Mountain Lawrence. No. Yeah, so it's obviously named after the the the, the bus, bus line. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was at the Taste of Lawrence a number of years ago, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, and stumbled on it. I was like, oh my god! Um, and I have I have a lot of Scarborough gear. Um, I mean, this is this is the oh crap! Oh there. Okay. Yeah. 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 So this is uh, and then I literally oh, just is that from the uh, Scarborough spots. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this morning, I just bought um, stuff for the Scarborough Health Foundation Love Scarborough yeah, yeah. campaign. They they're doing a, a pop up with Scarborough spots right now. That's so, right. Yeah. I saw I saw some of the t shirts the Leafs had. Yeah, and yeah. I think so they I'm, have they have a hoodie on there as well. I think. Yeah, I got a hoodie and a t shirt. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so you're you're a Scarborough guy as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, do you still live in Scarborough? No, I live uh, near High Park now um, in Bloor West, but I, I went to Lamoureux. I grew up, I lived on Broadway Town Circle. I kind of was there all okay. my life. Okay, yeah. time. Okay, so how old are you? <laughs> uh, 78, born. Okay, so you're my, you're my sister's age. Yeah, so we, my parents still live on Bridal Town Circle. What? Yeah. Oh my so, gosh. So I'm on the, I should say, I don't live there anymore, uh, but the southwest corner of Finch and Warden. Okay, we're, we were the northeast corner. Uh, so I went to Brook Mill for elementary and then uh, wow. Lamoureux. Yeah. My cousins went there, Riaz, who now lives back in Toronto. Okay. Um, he's young. He's younger than you, I think. Okay. And his older sister, who might be your age, uh, Tusnim, they went to Brook Mill. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so where, where did you go to school? Uh, so for, uh, so uh, public school, grade six is what, so grade five is what we moved. Yeah. So uh, North Bridalwood. Okay. Yeah. And then JB Tyrrell. Oh, yeah. And then Mac. Okay. I went to Mac uh, Brook Mill, McMillan, and Lamoureux. Okay. <clears throat> so my so mcmillan mcmillan that's just across the mall isn't it no the, uh mcmillan was uh off mcnichol um near yeah 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 yeah, yeah like yeah. a bit yeah wait mcnichol mcnichol no i'm thinking of another school okay you're thinking of um does uh, my son Mellon. go to mcmillan mcmillan is seven and eight isn't it it is yeah yeah so my son did go there for french immersion no terrell's the french immersion Unless Terrell's, it's changed. It, I think it's changed. Oh, okay. I mean, so I haven't went, been there. No, okay. He went to McMillan and now he's at Agent Court. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So he, so he's at <laughs> Agent Court now. Yeah. All right. We're not, we're not too far from Parkway Mall. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. That's, 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 that's the part of the hood that we're in. Yeah. And so you and I first connected years ago. I think it was Richard Petty who had told you about us. And then we, I feel like we had a coffee or we something. Did. He was on our he was on our board at the time. That's right. So you, I was at the time working for an agency, off of Bloor and is not is it not it's not college, somewhere around that area. Okay. Bloor Bloor East. Yeah. And I think we met somewhere in that neighborhood for a coffee or something. Yeah, we met. Uh, yeah, because our office is right at Young and Bloor. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's right. He was on the board. Yeah. Um, and I think he had, he had, that was his, probably around the first time he was on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, he's, I think he's like out in Windsor now, right? Yeah. I actually was out in that part of the world this summer. Okay. So we were, we did a road trip that took us from Windsor all the way to Sault Ste. Marie. Okay. Yeah. So we went like around um and so when i was there what a trip. <laughs> so yeah so we're in windsor my son wanted to stay in the hotel this one afternoon with the, with our dog he says i just want to stay in so i think we were like three or four days into the trip so he said okay you stay mom and i will go and check out a flea market or something like that we found a market 
my wife went to talk to some people at the market that were selling some some jams or sauces or something. And they told us about this town called uh, uh, Amitsburg. Amitsburg. I might be pronouncing it incorrectly. Am Amherstburg. Yeah. Amherstburg. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So she goes, yeah, I know like Richard lives there. She goes, who's Richard? I said, he's been on the podcast like a half a dozen times. Richard Petty. So she goes, oh, okay. So anyways, we go to the town. I go into his bookstore. Okay. That he has there. He's not there. So I message him. I took a picture and then he, he starts to berate me that I didn't tell him I was on my way. <laughs> he goes, scream, you idiot. You should have told me. I would have waited. <laughs> so I actually, I met up with him like two days later, I think. Nice. Okay. Met up there. He took me on a tour around the, so I think he's like bought the whole block. Oh, wow. Okay. And so he's got a bookstore. I think he's opening an ice cream shop, a huh. bakery, a candy store. Um, Amazing. Yeah, it's a nice. Have you been to that town before? I have not. No, no. It's, it's a really nice town. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really nice town, man. But thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. For sure. My pleasure. Yeah. 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 All, all of this is likely to be on the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but tell, uh, and, and Neil, tell me about the foundation, the Toronto Foundation, and, and, and then specifically your role as director of philanthropy, what, what does that actually mean? And what do you guys actually do? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, for starters, uh, just a, a big thanks for uh, extending the invitation. It's, um, yeah. it's, it's awesome to be a part of the conversation. And, and I, I did a bit of homework, um, uh, certainly listening to some of the past ones, just to kind of get a feel for, you know, the conversations, etc. And, um, you know, the, the few that really stuck out at me um, was, um, a couple of your episodes more recently with Dwayne Morgan and with Tanya Talaga, um, yeah, both yeah. of those really um, resonated for me. So uh, it was, yeah, it was nice to kind of put that, uh, have that framework to build from. Um, so Toronto Foundation, we are, uh, we're a registered charity here in the city of Toronto. We are part of a network of what are known as community foundations. And so a community foundation basically um, is, a, is an organization that uh, does a lot of work to understand what the issues are and what's going on that's affecting folks right in our own backyard. Um, and then we operationalize that and we kind of come up with ways to tell those stories and share that information, which then inspires people to actually find ways to give and volunteer and take part and, and try to make things better. And so um, there are close to 200 community foundations across the country, um, over a thousand in the United States. Um, the, the concept of a community foundation actually started uh, back in 1914, first one ever was in Cleveland, Ohio. And the history lesson is kind of interesting. So at the time, um, there was sort of this new concept of an endowment that uh, was being created where money would basically be uh, pooled together and invested. And then it would, uh, over time as it would grow, um, people would spend some of the money out of the, those earnings and, and kind of give it to, to charity and to things that, that they wanted to use to make a difference. And yeah. um, that concept really began primarily with, um, with churches, with universities, with hospitals. And so you now, in, in 2022, you sort of think about and you hear about, you know, these huge endowments that often a lot of big like Ivy, Ivy League schools and, and several Canadian universities as well. Um, and, and then along the way, individuals started saying, well, that concept's kind of interesting. And they said, well, like, I, I kind of want to have my own endowment. And so then uh, around that time, back in the early 1900s, in the States, you had families like the Carnegie's and the Rockefellers that said, you know, I want to go and do that. And so they did. Fast forward now, what ended up happening was there was a whole lot of other people that said, you know, there's this endowment concept that's now being used and people are thinking about the future needs of these big institutions, but who's thinking about the future needs of our city, of our community? And that's mm -hmm. where this concept of a community foundation was born. So it's basically an endowment created for the future needs of a city where, you know, you're putting the money in now, but you don't know what's on the other side. And you're kind of really looking into the future. And then along the way, um, individuals said, well, I don't necessarily need to go and do my own thing and have this big thing that I have to manage. Why don't I just pool my assets with you? 
And so that's where this concept of a donor advised fund, which is basically the product that we sell. Okay. So yeah. a, a community foundation offers donor advised funds, which is essentially having a private foundation. So now you have individuals and families out there that, um, that want to be a bit more involved, a bit more organized, maybe a bit more strategic in the way that they do their giving, and they look for a partner. And that's where we come in. So Toronto okay. Foundation is basically a home for a bunch of mini foundations that live underneath us. Oh, very interesting. Now let's take a couple of steps back. Yes. So I had to do some research. Okay. I tend to do that every once in a while. Um, how do you get from Waterloo, where you're studying science and business, to, to here? Like, what does that journey look like? Yeah, it's a uh, it's a pretty uh, fun journey to talk about. Um, yeah, so okay, so it really it's sort of encompassing. So um, I graduated from Waterloo in two thousand and two, um, and I had gone there after you know high school and everything in Scarborough, and, and deciding to go off to Waterloo for school. I was in a a co op program, and um, my first job out of school was at General Electric, and I was in sales with GE, and it was with um, GE Healthcare. So. We made all the diagnostic imaging equipment like x-rays, MRIs, uh, ultrasound machines. And I was basically hired into GE to basically um, take on a role as being a salesperson. And I was selling ultrasound machines to radiologists and obstetricians. And so in the early 2000s, um, that was my gig. And GE is a phenomenal employer to start your career with because sure. they basically have like, it's almost like a mini MBA. And, um, and you're kind of just like, you just learn everything about um, sales and marketing and, and customer relations and all of these things. And given my background in sort of science and business, going into a sort of a tech-based sales environment was, was pretty neat. It was kind of the, the best mix of the two parts of my discipline. And, um, and so, you know, I, 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 I did that role and I was um, doing well with it. And, and it was kind of this job that, that was really great. I was traveling all around Southwestern and Northern Ontario. I was doing well. So then my territory grew and started looking after Manitoba, then Saskatchewan, Alberta. And it was probably about three, four years into that where I basically, um, I had an opportunity to, to kind of be a part of some family travel associated with my older brother's wedding and some other things. And I was kind of looking at my options and thinking about things. And I asked about, um, you know, some time away, a leave of absence, sabbatical, and at the time, it just wasn't in the cards for the, for the company. And, um, and they said, you know, we can't really do something formally like that. And, and so I, I essentially sort of thought a bit further into the future. And I, I kind of, I realized that like I could blink right now and 40 years would go by. And, and you know, that would be my job. And, and I saw peers of mine that had been doing it for a long time, were wildly successful and all good stuff, right? Um, but I guess I just, I didn't want to blink. And, um, and I decided then that, uh, that I, I would resign <laughs> and, um, I, I trained my successor. I gave them a ton of notice. I kind of did everything the way you're supposed to. And then I, sure. I took off and I, I bought an around the world ticket and I traveled for most of 2006. Um, wow. where did you go? And, you know, had, had some pretty amazing experiences, but the two that really resonate for me were. I spent a few months in India, um, but this time, like I was there on my own without my family, all my previous trips, trips I had been with relatives and obviously with my parents. Um, and then I also spent a month trekking in the Himalayas and I summited a mountain in Nepal. Wow. And while I was doing those things um, in Nepal and also in India, I found some local NGOs that I was doing some work with. And, and I just started like really reconnecting with this sense of community and this sense of, um, rolling up your sleeves and getting involved and, and kind of helping. And um, it was when I returned to Toronto in 2007, uh, when I was starting to think about what's next for me from a career perspective, where I basically just started connecting some dots. So I, I knew that I, I had this sales background and this account management background, and I was kind of good at that kind of world, that people world. But then I realized that, you know, the, the kind of the, using those skills within the corporate environment was, was an option, but, but I, I was curious, you know, what other options might there be? And that's where I kind of connected the dots and realized that 
the nonprofit sector, specifically fundraising and philanthropy, was a, a place where I might find a home. And so um, after an, a pretty extensive search through 07 and meeting a lot of folks and making connections, I, in September of 07, I landed at United Way Toronto. And um, I was working there in sort of corporate fundraising, and, and it was an amazing place to start my nonprofit career. Um, because you really understand the breadth and depth of an organization like United Way and just how integral they are to so many communities and so many folks that often can't make that ask on their own, can't get into that boardroom on their own. There's someone like United Way doing it on their behalf. Um, and after five years there, I then sort of found the next opportunity and, and came to Toronto Foundation. So this is actually my, my 10th year at Toronto Foundation um, this year. And uh, wow. it's been quite a journey. Yeah. That is amazing. So obviously, I mean, the past two years has been really, I guess, interesting is a word we could use. <laughs> yeah. But I think especially with the work that you do, because not that these were new inequities that all of a sudden came out, but I think a spotlight was was was, was shone on them. You know, we started to realize that, yes, maybe people like you and I can work from home, but maybe there's people that really don't want to be at home. Um, maybe there isn't a home for people to be at. I remember, you know, you mentioned uh, Tanya, someone that I've had on the podcast as a wonderful uh, thinker and an author. Um, we were told two years ago, wash your hands. And there are communities around this country that they don't have actually water, clean water to clean their hands with. You know, and, and so there's inequities like this, yeah. um, you know, food banks uh, earlier on had had a challenge. Through the work that you're doing, um, what have you been seeing in terms of where, you know, as, as a city, as a country, maybe where we're falling short and and maybe some things where we're actually, you know, seeing some people or some organizations, you know, rise up to help others. Yeah, um, there, there's a lot to unpack there, Kareem. Um, I would say a, a number of things. Um, for starters, uh, yeah, this this year has been, um, or these last few years have been um, um, really tough for a lot of folks. I think while I can say that, yeah, it's been tough for me and my family, probably you and yours and others, like nowhere near the same amount of toughness that it's sure. been for so many other folks, right? And um, and I think that's like that alone is something to really underscore, right? Because there's a lot of people kind of in a certain socioeconomic stratosphere within a city like Toronto that for the most part, right? Like the, the transition to working online, um, that, that, that shipment that arrives on your doorstep, um, you know, that takeout that comes via some food delivery service, like it's all still happening. And, and, your life has generally still continued. Sure, there have been inconveniences and maybe there's been some illness, but and and possibly some loss as well, right? But um I, I think the the types of things that certain communities, I think of racialized communities, black communities, indigenous communities, like it's just a whole other level, right? Um mm -hmm. you you talked earlier um just talking about even transportation, right? And you think all of us that sort of are in quote unquote, like white collar kind of jobs, right? Like where we can just shift to online working, et cetera. Like, I mean, I, I had a, well, a Metro pass previously now a Presto card, but like, I was one of those people that was commuting every day, you know, for yeah. forever. Right. And, and all of a sudden, you know, I, 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 since March of 2020, I can probably count, like I've been on the TTC less than 10 times. Yeah. Right. And and there's so many people that cannot say that. They've continued to have to do that throughout this entire pandemic. And, you know, they're they're going to jobs where they're cleaners or they're doing other sure. types of work that like just can't be done remotely, right? And 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 all of those types of jobs tend to be, again, certain socioeconomic class that ends up having to do them. And so I, I think, you know, the inequities um that that we're underpinning society like there 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 has been a, a a gap right between quote unquote the haves and the have nots and that 
gap or that crack, whatever you want to call it, it's it's just continued to exacerbate. And that crack is now a chasm and it's only going in the wrong direction, unfortunately. And like so many of us on the on the like positive side of that chasm need to figure out our part in that and what we can do about it and what we can do to try to solve it. The challenge though, is that for a lot of us, we can just continue living our lives kind of ignoring it. And it's sure. not, it's not in our face. It's not sure. It might be on the news. Sure. It might be somewhere that we, but, but especially like if we're not going downtown as much, if we're not even commuting to work, like we're not actually seeing a lot of this stuff firsthand, especially something like the homelessness epidemic, right? Like we're not seeing that in real time the way we once did. And so it's really unfortunate, right? Because um, some of those things are real challenges that that are just not uh, like they, they just, they get ignored. Um, the other thing I, I, you've got, your, your, your kid is um, slightly bigger than mine, but like has been going through virtual school and and you think about, you know, all these families that have had to do this pivot to virtual school and and just think, right, like, sure, we have an, an iPad or a computer that a kid can get on. We have high speed Internet. That, that's all good. Like and we're also home to provide tech support. But again, think of these families that A, didn't have equipment. B, both parents are working because they're in blue collar jobs and they can't be at home. So who's providing tech support? Who's at home with these kids? Um, so that's a challenge. The other thing I, I remember hearing early days of the pandemic was, um, so someone like Children's Aid Society, a big thing that that they rely on actually is hearing about issues when kids are at school. That's a way for them to really understand uh-huh. if a kid is in abuse or, or something's going on. But all of a sudden, back in the spring of 2020, when everyone was at home and kids in particular were at home, if you're in a, in a home that is unsafe, Um, and the majority of kids tend to have their cameras off, like you don't actually, teachers and and like, they don't have the same access to information anymore. And so just imagine what was going on in some of those households where Mm. stress is at an all time high. And like, it's just all of these things compound and exacerbate. And it's really, um, yeah, there's just, there, there's so much to say. So let me just pause there and see if if you've got any reactions. No, I mean, I, I, I think that's, I, I thought I'd thought of all of, you know, everything that, you know, these gaps that we have, but I, I, that, that one, I don't know if I had thought of that one before, maybe I did earlier on, but you're right. That's, that's so very, that's so very important. And and so are there um, programs or organizations that, that you've seen, maybe ones that Toronto Foundation supports in some way or, or things that you've seen just because of the line of work that you're in, um, that have been instrumental in, um, in in helping people. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of really great examples of people stepping up in, in support of their community. I you know I, I think of a, a few that certainly come to mind. Like like I'll give you a, a couple different flavors. So one is um, there's an amazing organization in our city called Visions of Science. And Visions of Science, um, folks should look them up. Um, they do incredible work really focused on providing STEM-based education for um, primarily young elementary students. Um, Their CEO, Eugenia Adi Duodu, um, is, uh, she's a PhD, she's an incredible human being and somebody that, um, you know, forever their work was being done in person um, in communities like Swansea Muse and and, uh, Regent Park and other parts of the city where, you know, they'd be, in the same room with these kids, really trying to provide this this additional education and additional resources that kind of get kids motivated and excited. Because for a lot of communities in certain parts of the city, something like really going deeper into STEM and science and understanding these concepts, like it just seems so foreign. It seems like something that is just not accessible for them. And so the pandemic hits and, you know, all of a sudden it really like, all that kind of stuff just shuts down, right? Because it can't be done in school, it can't be done in person, et cetera. But Visions of Science really quickly figured out a plan and they started offering their services online. And 
um, kids were participating and learning and, and their coaches were continuing to provide the, the opportunities and they got technology made available to people, et cetera. And they just, they found a way to provide a service that a lot of kids really relied on. And so that's kind of an example of, of an organization that really continued to have kids top of mind and continue to have their learning top of mind because it's the kind of thing that these kids needed during sure. moments of disruption. Um, another organization that uh, it's a bit more kind of higher level, but I think it's an important one to highlight is during these last couple of years, um, a, a really important organization that really, um, um, uh, I guess what's the word, really started from nothing and really is now um, out there and making moves is the Foundation for Black Communities. And um, folks should look them up as well because FBC, um, it's a national organization that um, did, um, they, they released a report, it's on their website, it's called Unfunded. And it's all about the focus of um, how philanthropy currently is not um, equitable and not supporting communities in need um, that sort of need it the most. And um, you know, the, the statistic that I wanna share um, from their report is, where are we here? Um, in 2017 and 18, this is the data that they were using, only 0.13% of all philanthropic funding in Canada was given to black led and black serving organizations. 0.13%, okay? And the stat that's connected to that, that really, really is important for folks to know is, so Imagine Canada, which is a, a big think tank across the country that does a lot of important work looking at the charitable sector and supporting corporate social responsibility and kind of just thinking about these things. They released some data a few years ago that said 66% of all charitable giving in this country. So that's, you know, the, the, the $20 you give, the $2,000 that someone else gives, all of that total together, 66% of it goes to 1% of the charities in this country. Wow. 1% of the charities get, you know, nearly 70% of the money. And, you know, I'm not here to say those 1% don't matter because for sure, a lot of that 1% is, is even things like hospitals and universities. And we understand healthcare and education are so critical. Like these things, I'm not saying stop. What I am saying though is, is that there are ways to focus on some of these things that really are different than what people are doing right now. And some concrete examples. And actually it ties back to the start of our conversation actually around Scarborough. And yeah. so look at the campaign going on right now uh, in our city uh, that the Scarborough Hospital Foundation is going, right? And so it's the Love Scarborough campaign. And their whole thing is, is that Scarborough represents 25% of the of Toronto's population, but they only get one percent of the healthcare philanthropy funding. Wow. Okay, and that's like that's the tagline of their campaign, and it's very clear that the math is there. Like it's they're not no one's making this stuff up, right? It's just the way it is. And if you think about that, and you think about who lives in Scarborough and and who has access and who needs access, versus you think about some other healthcare institutions and other parts of our city, other parts of this country, like it's just, it's night and day. And so like there, there's, there's something that needs to change there. Um, and, and, you know, when you think I, I referenced visions of science earlier, right? Like imagine for a second, folks that care so much about giving and support higher ed and, and you know, do these really big things at uh, universities and colleges and stuff like that. Imagine that, like, instead of doing something that was eight figures, they did something that was seven figures, which is still very significant. And then they used that difference and they started looking at um, way downstream and they started focusing on someone like a Visions of Science. Because how is a kid from Regent Park or Rexdale ever going to find themselves at a higher institution if they don't see a pathway from when they're like five, 10 years old to even know that STEM is? something that they could even consider. And so it's kind of like looking at the inequity in giving, the inequity in philanthropy, that's something that I think is really critical for folks to be thinking about. That is that is so interesting. Yeah, I never thought about that, but you're right about that Love Scarborough one. You know, you, you see that and you hear that, but then you extrapolate that across the city, the province, the country, and you realize that's probably the same all over the place, right? Yeah, Others, 
other Scarboroughs. Scarboroughs in, in Vancouver, in Montreal, in yeah. Calgary. Yeah, totally. That's really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, tell Karim, me. Yeah. Sorry, let me, uh, there's there's one other thing I think is interesting and, and sure, this sure. is a little bit self-serving, but I think it's it's a, it's, it's a greater purpose. It's, um, so I, I, I would encourage people to check out if, if they have some time to, to go to Toronto Foundation's website, there's something called the Black and Indigenous Futures Fund. And this is a, this is a, a grant stream that we ran last year where we basically said, you know, we know that um, that in particular in a city like Toronto, Black communities and Indigenous communities are not being serviced in the same way that other communities are when it comes to philanthropy. And so what we launched last year was a grant stream specifically focused on Black-led and serving, Indigenous-led and serving organizations. And um, what was unique about this is a couple of things. One, um, we actually raised um, a bunch of money from some of our longer time donors that we used as matching funds. And then we went to a whole other set of donors and we said, hey, if, if you guys give to any of these organizations that, that have been identified, your dollars are going to be matched by this pool that we initially fundraised over here. So it started to like this concept of leverage and this concept of pooling. It starts moving more money into directions that really need it. But more importantly, on the front end, when we put out the, the call to applications of who, who could apply for this grant, we went through an extensive process with um, other community members from Black and Indigenous populations in this city that work in these communities. They were the decision makers on who actually would get this funding and how it would be allocated. And so that's really important too, because it's this whole idea of control. Who controls the, the, the purse strings, the concepts, et cetera, right? So on the one hand, Toronto Foundation, we really tried to remove, remove ourselves from the control element by giving that to somebody else to make that decision. And then when we went out to raise that initial um, uh, uh, seed of, um, of matching dollars, we asked all those donors to give up control as well, because we basically said, ah. give up unrestricted dollars that we can then use and, and allocate in a way that makes sense. And so this concept of unrestricted funding is really critical because essentially it means giving with no strings attached. And you probably hear of, or your listeners might know of, like sometimes there would be philanthropic gifts announced or things happening where they say, okay, this money's being used going to such and such organization to do such and such A, B, C, X, Y, Z. The challenge with stuff like that is, is once you start putting conditions on something, it really starts hampering the ability for that organization to actually do what's best for them. And so when you can give an unrestricted gift to a charity, it allows the charity, the expertise at that charity to decide what's most critical and what's most needed for their organizations. And so, and, and, and more importantly, the constituents they serve. And so this concept of unrestricted giving is something that's really critical that I want to make sure people understand. That's amazing. I want to ask you another about another program I, I, I recently read about. Um, a couple of years ago, you started um, Vision 2020. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so, Kareem, this is this is a really exciting um, part of our work. Um, this started about five years ago, and the thinking at the time was we wanted to ensure that. Uh, Toronto Foundation really reflected uh, the city of Toronto in all its ways. Um, and so for, for decades, Toronto Foundation has been around since 1981. So we're, um, we're, we're just over 40. And, um, and when we launched this, it was back in 2017. So we'd been around for a while. And for a long time, um, our kind of primary donor pool um, looked a lot like kind of what you'd expect Bay Street to look like. And um, and, you know, it, it's kind of, it's just kind of what it is, right? Like, it's kind of just the way giving and philanthropy has kind of been done in a city like Toronto and in other big cities across North America for forever. Um, and what we started to really think about was like how, like, that's an important part of Toronto, but it's not all of Toronto, right? Like Toronto is over 50% foreign born now. And, um, mm. and we... We have a lot of folks that are from other places. We're increasingly a younger city as well. Um, and, you know, there's just more people that have kind of these interests and ideas about ways that they want to experience their city, be a part of their city, support their city. And so 
Toronto's foundation, us, needs to reflect that. And so what we basically did was we launched, um, I kind of uh, sometimes refer to it as a philanthropic MBA program. And so what we created was this curriculum where folks could come and join us. They become a fund holder. So I said earlier, you know, the product we sell is this thing called a donor advised fund. So somebody comes and sets up a donor advised fund with us. Now, um, there is a bit of a sort of um, entry point there. So the minimum to set up a fund is $10,000. Um, so it's not astronomical, but it's also not completely accessible for everybody. I totally understand that. Um, having said that, though, so so folks that can um, find their way to, to get to that, and it's over two years, um, they, they make that commitment. And then they set up one of these funds with us. That fund acts as kind of like a mini foundation that, you know, they can put their name on, they can put, you know, maybe a lost loved one, they can memorialize somebody with it, etc. So there's all sorts of motivations. But the concept of a legacy is something that's really interesting for folks. And this idea of like building a legacy going forward through your philanthropy is something that's really of interest. And so folks set that up and they take part in this learning journey. This learning journey that we've developed now, um, we're five years in, uh, we're now into the fourth edition of this program. Um, and it's uh, it's really fascinating. So, so this curriculum, like we, we do a session all around power and privilege as it connects to giving. And so we go deep into helping people understand, we do this exercise called an identity wheel that really gets people kind of understanding how they see themselves and how the world sees them. And then how those things in some cases are exactly the same and in some cases are completely not the same. And, and then how do you carry yourself as a result? We do an exercise all around values and really connecting your personal values to your giving. What's really neat is, is when you have a family participating in one of these workshops, individually, they all do um, an exercise like that. So they learn a thing or two about themselves, but then they converse as a family and you start seeing, you know, how do uh, the, the partners sort of think how maybe if there's kids involved, how do they think about this stuff? And so it's really fascinating to see how that all uncovers. We, um, we do a session all around, it's called, um, it's a speed dating session. So basically our participants meet executive directors and leaders of small, medium-sized grassroots organizations in the city. And they learn about what they're doing and, and how they can get involved. And so the whole point of this is, is that when people get involved and, and make that decision A to like get more organized with their giving and be more strategic, et cetera, very few actually have a real sense of what it is they wanna do and how they wanna go about doing that. The large bulk of them are looking for some help and that's where we think we come in because we've been doing Toronto's Vital Signs, which is basically an annual report for the city. We've been doing that a quality of life study for the last 20 plus years. So we're sitting on a lot of data, a lot of really important information about the city. It's trends that we can see that have been developing for years. So we've basically found a way to operationalize and like share all of that in a way that really provides value add for folks. And so this idea of kind of participating in this MBA is a way to in some ways, build a foundation for their foundation. And that's a way that I like to think about it. It's interesting you say you sit on a lot of data. I, I have this conversation on and off with a co-host of mine on another podcast. Uh, his name is Greg. He used to work with a flight center. He used to take care of all of their e-commerce um, and backend stuff. And so he's had the opportunity to travel the world uh, you know, with, with the work that he used to do with them. And we've had conversations. In fact, we were going to start a podcast called Toronto, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hmm. Uh, and I was going to sit on the ugly side of things and, and tell him why Toronto is not one of the greatest cities in the world. And he was going to sit on the side of, no, Toronto is actually the greatest city. And he would stand by it. He says, I've been all over the world, Kareem, and there's nothing. I go, come on, Really? so many places I've been, not as much as him, but I said, there's, we, we fall short in so many places. Anyways, I say all that, Anil, to ask you this question. You know, we've, we see studies, uh, you know, Toronto's the first, second best place living, you know, standard of living and so on and so forth. With what you know, <laughs> both through the work that you do, the data that you see, um and just you as a as a resident is uh 
Is Toronto one of the greatest cities? Depends who you are. Ah, uh, okay. yeah, so that's, that's yes. the big, that's, that's a very interesting answer, isn't it? That's the caveat, right? So yeah. you got it like, so when, when the economist releases their like, you know, most livable cities or when some other publication releases the best city in the world, blah, blah, blah. Like, I mean, for sure, you gotta, you gotta remember a who's sponsoring that research B who did they actually talk to and who did they research? Like who are the test subjects? Um, because ultimately a lot of that stuff, it comes down to things like, you know, where, where large entities can host conferences, where large employers can, you know, attract talent. Like it's, it's all connected to, to that kind of stuff. Right. And so for sure, if you ask people from, you know, neighborhoods close to where you and I grew up, or you ask people from, you know, other corners of this city, um, they're not going to say Toronto is the most livable place in the world. Like, like they're living there, but it's like really hard. Right. Yeah. But then you ask me in Blue West village, I'm going to say something very different. Um, and so like, it really depends who you are, where you are, what, you know, what you have access to, et cetera. Like, you know, what I will say is, is like, from my vantage point, like there's so much good in this city and so many assets. And like, I adore this city and, and there's so much that I love about it. And then there's so much that infuriates me as well. But like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of those things that like, I want to, I want to be on the side of trying to work to make it better. And so that's what I'm going to keep doing, but not enough of us, I don't think Kareem are, are looking beyond ourselves, beyond our families. And I think that's the thing that I really want people to think about is like, how can we actually, how can we make this city the thing that that headline says for more of us because right now it is that for some of us but definitely not for all of us and so like that's the that's the thing so maybe i've copped out on my answer but... no that's that's actually probably the the, the most truthful answer i've heard <laughs> okay for sure yeah no to be honest with you yeah for sure um i mean we can we could take this in, in so many directions but i know we, we're sort of nearing the end uh, of, of our time here. Um, so, you know, just some, I don't want to say quick, uh, rapid fire stuff, but I, I've got a series of questions I want to ask you. Um, do you still play Scrabble? <laughs> oh, you know about this, eh? Um, so, uh, <laughs> I am a terrible Scrabble player. Um, my wife, on the other hand, oh, is, okay. it, it's her and her family. They are rock stars in the game and um and yeah they they get annoyed with me because i take way too long and and then i come up with like a, a four letter word that's worth like five points or something right so it's just like it's it, no one in my family plays with me anymore because they're just they're so good and and i just annoy them so yeah unfortunately um uh that's not my thing anymore sadly but um yeah, I mean, you're you're referencing um, our wedding, I think, right? You probably found. Yeah, something. yeah. So, what was that? A was. <laughs> so, so tell the story, but I'm I'm curious. Like, was it a surprise that it came through Scrabble? Yeah, uh, I think it was. Um, I okay. mean, I know how important that is for her, and uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of funny. I found back in twenty, I guess, oh nine when I proposed. Um, uh, there was, I, I found that the diamond edition of Scrabble, it was some, it was released that year. And so I, I, um, I kind of taped or glued, probably taped the letters on the board and essentially it said like, will you marry me? And, and I kind of put it back in the wrapping and I gave it to her as a gift and, and then she opened it and, you know, the rest all happened. And so it, uh, it was fun, but yeah, it was, uh, we had a we had a pretty nerdy wedding. Um, yes. We, uh, <laughs> so um, the, the headline in the article that was written uh, was my big fat geek wedding, and the reason being, um, well, a we got married at the science center. Um, we we had a very science themed wedding, um, which was super fun. So my wife Nicole and I, um, we didn't know each other at the time, but we, we actually both worked at the science center back when we were um, younger. We I was a host there, so I used to do some of the demonstrations. Um, she was a camp counselor at one point, and then I did a high school science program there as well. So yeah, we both got some history there. And um, 
yeah, getting married there just was really fun. It was really cool. And uh, we had the Van de Graaff generator as uh, as a, you know, a, a party trick during cocktails. And so people could touch the ball and their hair would go all over the place. And so that was fun. And then we, we had a, um, a periodic table was our, was our uh, seating chart. And so I saw that was sitting at, uh, you know, like the hydrogen table, the helium table, that kind of stuff. And and our, our flowers at the centerpieces were in Bunsen burn, or not Bunsen burn, in, uh, in beakers or no graduated cylinders. That's it. And uh, yeah, so no, we, we had some fun with it and, and that was, uh, that was a while ago, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the Scrabble connection. <laughs> so as, as you take your kids to the Ontario Science Center um, during a March break or something like that, um, how, how many times have you told them the story and are they sick of it yet? <laughs> yeah you know it's funny we haven't told them that many times I think I think we realized it's, uh, it's not really they'll they laugh about it but it's uh yeah it's 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 funny um yeah no they're they're they I mean they they love the science center it's a, it's a great spot and it's something that's really in our lives we we're we're big fans of the place and uh I mean that's an example right of of a kind of institution in this city that um yeah really is is there for people and you think about so so you know coming back to some threads of our conversation you think about the science center and you think about the community that they're in right like they're right in Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park and how how much intention that organization has had throughout their decision making to really be mindful of how can we make ourselves as accessible as possible for the residents of these communities who often don't get access to lots of other arts and culture in this city, but can come to our place because it's in their backyard. And, and how can they make those connections with community? How can they take science to those communities when they can't come to them? Like, that's an example of the kinds of ways that places can be more intentional about the way that they do their work. And so, you know, kudos and hats off to the work of the Science Center because they, they have that front, front of mind and they really do think about the implications of their work. Wonderful. Listen, as we wrap it up, let me ask you some Scarborough questions. Here. Yeah, for sure. Um, favorite bus route? Oh, I mean, I it has to be the 39 East. Um, I, I, I'm dating. I mean, I don't think it's called the 39 East anymore, but uh, that was that's the Finch East bus. And, and um, I was on Broadtown Circle. So that was my bus. <laughs> there you go. Uh, favorite mall? I mean, my my home mall was Bridalwood Mall, um, so so that's uh, that's the spot. But uh, yeah, it's 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 had its moments. I would say. Um, yeah, I was a big. I mean, I, I worked for a little while at the at the public library there. I'm I'm okay. a big fan of uh, of libraries, uh, and so I'm glad they have one. And uh, but yeah, it's uh, Scarborough malls are are kind of you know they're they're kind of what they are. <laughs> I'm not yeah, a big yeah. mall person though, so yeah. Interestingly enough, I don't know if a lot of people know this, it just might be the only mall in Toronto, if not the country, that has a graveyard. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's just, wow, yeah. you know, it's I'm amazing that it you, does. I'm going to send you a photo. A friend of mine recently showed me, so you can go on the Tro City of Toronto website and yeah. there's this archive section where you can find old photos of I mean, literally anything. And I typed in Broadwood Mall when he was telling me about it. And I found sort of the initial photo of the graveyard and like before they had built the mall and then like kind of some of the history about like why that happened the way it did. So I'll, I'll send you that link. Yeah, there was a great burger place there uh, oh, on, the, yeah. on um, the second floor. Yeah, it's not there yeah, anymore. Yeah. Burger Palace. Yes. Yeah, it's That's, not there. Oh, OK. No, no, it is yeah, not Yeah, everyone there. from Lamb used to go there for lunch. Oh, it was the best, the best fries. The <laughs> fries were crispy, warm, just, uh, yeah. just amazing. That's absolutely. Um, favorite restaurant? In Scarborough or in general? Yeah, Scarborough. It has to be Scarborough. Scarborough. Okay. And, and for those, um, like, there's people that don't know, like, Scarborough has some oh. amazing food, like, from oh. all over the world you could find in Scarborough. Yeah, for sure. You know, 100%. we're not just saying this because we're from there, like, like, literally. <laughs> some good food yeah yeah totally um oh man there's a few uh for sure um uh you know one that comes to mind is uh is 
I haven't been there in a little while, but definitely growing up, it was the spot is uh, Feder Federick's, the, the Hakka yeah. place. Um, yep. um, really good food. Uh, there was um, closer to us, uh, kind of in the uh, where pharmacy and uh, and shepherd area. Mm -hmm. There was a nut, is it China Cottage? Um, China another... Cottage is like hop, skip and a jump from my place. Okay. Yeah, there's so also another... Lynn Garden. Lynn Garden, that's the one I was thinking of. You're thinking of, of Lynn Garden, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Lynn Garden. That's probably up there for me. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Hakka food. And uh, yeah, that that's kind of like a really well-known one in uh, in Scarborough, I'd say. People come from all over the place Yeah, to totally. go to uh, to Lynn Garden. Yeah. But uh, China Cottage is a favorite. If I could eat that like every week, <laughs> I, would, I would be in heaven. Awesome. I would be in heaven. The Hakka fish. I don't know if oh, you ever tried that. The haka I haven't, fish. but I will. I'll, I'll add that to the list. Yeah. Look and something to. I discovered, they have haka fries. What? I discovered okay. that like two years ago. Okay. Haka fries. But you have to have it fresh. You can't wait. No, no, no. no. Okay. You know, yeah, you know, so you go there, drive there, and then someone has to open it up in the car on your way home. Yeah. And everyone gets a fork and starts. Oh, it's, <laughs> it is It is so good. Um, awesome. I, I know you are a, a huge sports fan. Totally. Uh, Raptors and, and Jays. Uh, and so I'm sure you know that Scarborough has a new basketball team. Uh, I'm, af I'm afraid of messing up the name, so I'm going to go quickly. Okay. And find out the name of this. So there's a, the Canadian Basketball League. Yeah. Um, oh, has, has a scar. I want to say it's called the scarborough shooting stars cool okay scarborough shooting starts uh they start may of this year okay part of, the, part gonna... of the, the canadian elite basketball league cool okay. they'll be playing out of the pan am center i thought so okay yeah that's yeah. a great facility yeah yeah so looking forward to going to that totally uh, yeah. for sure but um anil thank you so much for your Crazy. time I really appreciate it. Um, and we, is there anything else you wanted to to talk about? Was there anything you wanted to make sure people know? Um, I guess just maybe kind of the, the last thought is just like philanthropy sometimes feels like this, this big word, right? And it's kind of like, you know, it's like, it, it's fairly easy for folks to say, oh, uh, that's not me. That's like, that's that person that lives over there, that person that has that big job, like they're, they can be a philanthropist. I'm just going to, you know, give a little bit here and there. And I, I mean, I just, every, anyone that can, um, I, I just want people to, to think of themselves um, however they can through that word and, and find the way that makes the most sense. Having said that, right, like, like there are folks that are probably listening to this show right now um, that, uh, that, you know, might just think like it's time to get a little bit more organized and it's time to sort of think about how they might do that. Whether or not they end up at a place like this, Toronto Foundation, like I, I, I want them to know that we exist and we have a lot of resources that are available to them. Um, and and you know, like I think it's just kind of navigating this charitable landscape. It's it's not easy. It's fairly complicated, and there's a lot of options and things to do. And so um, it's really critical just to sort of understand and have good um, good opportunities and good good ways of doing it. Um, I would say, you know, here in at Toronto Foundation, what's really neat is, is um, you know, while, so we have like 700 different individuals and families that have funds with us, right? And they, they range in size from, I, I told you at the low end, the minimum is $10,000. And then there's folks like in the multi-millions, you know, there's, there's people people would have heard of, right? Like there's someone like Coach Nick Nurse, for instance, there is, um, you know, when, when the Downey Wenjack Fund was first started, it, it was incubated here. It's now off and doing some amazing things elsewhere. So there's like, you know, ways that we can be of support to people that are, you know, really doing important things and, and have a bit of a platform. But there's so many other folks that are just like, they just want to kind of do good in their way. And, yeah. um, and you know, that's what we're here for. And so, um, yeah, we can be of service and, and support to any one of them. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, I just want folks to know that philanthropy is not as inaccessible as they might think it is. Um, and everyone can kind of do their part. Um, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, I think there's an opportunity for all of us to work harder to make this city 
what it can be for some of us right now, but we want it to be that way for more of us and, and, and ideally all of us. So that's, uh, that's kind of maybe how I would close. And if people are going online and they want to find out more information, what's the website? Yeah, so it's uh, torontofoundation.ca and our Twitter, our Instagram is at torontofdn. Um, and then I'm on all those platforms at, at a underscore G-O-K-S. Awesome. Anil, again, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Kareem. I really appreciate it. That was good, man. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I, I, it's 